Um, it's lovely to be here once again, um, opening up uh, God's Word as a, as a family. Um, where are we at? Hang on, that's slide three. Let's work out what's going on here. Lovely. Is that going to? Yeah, I can click. Super. So, this is part of our, uh, of our Lent series. We always spend uh, Lent, the season of Lent, um, as, as is traditional in, in the Christian church and has been for, for kind of centuries, preparing ourselves to think about, about the cross. You get this kind of um, mind turning towards Easter and, the, and days of kind of preparation. And traditionally, that's been about fasting and about giving um, in order to in order to kind of orientate ourselves with the with the with the, the mind of Jesus, um, this year our theme for Lent is freely you have received now freely give. Um, we picked that just just to 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 yeah to focus on that kind of traditional Lent message, um, and and uh, see what God had to had to say for us. Sorry, what God had to say to us. Um, Don uh, clattered through uh, a fair chunk of Luke uh, l- last week, and I'm, I've got the privilege of picking out a couple of uh, a couple of highlights within what he covered um, this week. So we're in um, we're in. Can I have the next slide? Thanks, guys. This I'm not sure this clicker is working. Um, thanks. I'll just I'll just call out the transitions from from, from now. So uh, Don Don clattered through. So the whole book of Luke. The whole book of Luke is a journey from the north of Israel down to Jerusalem. So the start of Luke starts with, the, with Jesus' ministry in the north, and it, and it kind of works down towards Jerusalem. We're, we're already told in the book, we're told as early as uh, Luke 9, that Jesus has turned his face towards Jerusalem. And in like, like in the Lord of the Rings, this journey is progressing towards an end point. Frodo has turned his face towards Mount Doom. Jesus has turned his face towards Jerusalem, and that's, that's where he's heading. Um, Passover is in sight. These uh, psalms of the ascents, these psalms that God's people would sing about coming up to Jerusalem are in play. We, when, we, when we looked at the psalms, we looked at a few of them. Let's go up to the house of the Lord, and, and they're going up for, for Passover, but Jesus knows why he's going there. He's predicted his death already in Luke, and he'll do so again immediately after the passages that we're looking at. There's this very strong sense in the book of Luke and in the way it portrays Jesus' ministry about where it's all heading, about the pointy end. Um, and Don was, Don was pointing out and did it, did, it, did it really well that this is kind of his last teaching block. When I'm, when I'm teaching, um, uh, my, students, my students, like they tend to arrive a wee bit late and then maybe they're not focused for the first bit. So you never front load the lecture with with the good bits, you know? And then in the lecture series, like, what's going to be on the test? Well, that, that heads towards the end. So as Jesus kind of enters his final teaching block, we can intuit that there's going to be something, something important going on. He's going to kind of cover the good stuff. And as Don pointed out last week, this last teaching block, this last chunk of teaching, focuses largely on our relationships uh, with our wealth, our money, and our stuff, our possessions. Um, interestingly, Paul, who I don't know, I think of a, a, as a very academic teacher, Paul does the same. In Acts 20, when Paul is leaving his friends for the final time, these people he's been on mission with, in Acts 20, he says to them two things. One is about the gospel, which we might expect, believe the gospel. And then two is about giving and generosity and, uh, and what we do with our possessions. And I think, I think that's that, that's interesting. You know, both both these primary teachers um, within within the New Testament have that same pattern of saying, and finally, giving, and finally, generosity. Next slide, thanks, guys. So, um, if you'll turn with me um, to Luke, it's Luke um, eighteen eighteen. And I'll give you two minutes to get there. Um, we're looking. I love the book of Luke for a number of reasons, but my first is, so the primary reason is it, it shows Jesus in contact with real people. It shows Jesus living among people and engaging with them 
and, and, and kind of bumping into them and having, having real conversations with, with real people. And this is, this is an example of one of these. So I'll just I'll read, I'll read from, from Luke 18, 18. A certain ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. All these I have kept since I was a boy, he said. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When he heard this, he became very sad because he was a man of great wealth. Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard this asked, who then can be saved? Jesus replied, what is impossible with men is possible with God. Peter said to him, we've left all that we had to follow you. I tell you the truth, Jesus said to them, no one who's left home or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come, eternal life. So, so, so there we go. That's that's a, that's a kind of re- real interaction. So we, I, I read you the version from Luke Matthew and Mark and Luke all all tell this same this same story. Um, Don covered it last week. I think I think Don was perhaps a little a little harsh on him. I, I don't know on this on this on this rich young man who was talking to Jesus. Um, I I think you know. I've titled this slide, A Man of Distinction, and it's like, as soon as he walks in the joint, you can see that he is a man of distinction. He is an impressive man. Firstly, he is, he is morally wealthy. Jesus, Jesus says to him, Jesus identifies uh, the law. You know, Jesus is not unafraid, especially in ministering in Luke, about challenging other people on their lack of personal holiness. And it's not the challenge he picks up here. We can assume, therefore, that this young man is, is morally wealthy. One thing our society shares with the first century society is the belief that kind of wealth is goodness. If they had CEO podcasts in the first century, they would have been you know, a real source of entertainment. This belief that, that wealth was a kind of self-perpetuating reward from God for, for, for goodness. And that's, that's something here. And I think, I think finally, this guy recognizes, he recognizes that he doesn't have it all together. He comes at least, some, uh, at least somewhat with a, with a humble heart. You know, he, he asks Jesus, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So he's coming as a seeker. He's coming with this great moral background and this impressive financial wealth. If this was somebody coming among us at ACC, I think we'd be quite excited. I think we'd say, you know, this, this, guy's, this guy's great. He's, he's with, you know, let's, let's, let's bring him in. Let's, let's chat to him. You know, any other religious teacher when faced with this guy would say, you know, you're my, you're my perfect convert. But, and this becomes clear as, he, as Jesus talks to him, he's, he's got it so wrong. He's got it so wrong um, we're told he walks away sad. And he walks away sad for three reasons. And very quickly, I'll dig into them. He walks away sad because Jesus explodes his idea of what being good means. Number two, Jesus explodes his idea of what religion is. And number three, Jesus explodes his idea of ideas. He gets really personal. So I'll dig down into those, into, into those three things. So firstly, Jesus explodes his idea of what being good means. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answers. And the picture we're given here uh, only God is good. Jesus is saying, you compare yourself to those folks around you. 
Your standard is other people. You are constantly saying, I'm better than him, I'm better than him, I'm better than him, I'm better than him. And based on the qualities of your life, you might have a point. However, only God is good. Don Carson, when, when he's writing about this passage, says, Jesus looks at him and says, my friend, your application to join the Trinity has been refused. You're comparing yourself to the wrong group of people. Point two, Jesus explodes his idea of what religion is. I was watching the band warm up. Always good. If you get the chance to be here early, Peter will, Peter will absolutely agree. Get the chance to be here early, be here early. Um, Peter was very restrained um, before um, about the service starting at 11. It's a real passion of his. But if you get the chance to be here early and you watch the, and you watch the band um, warming up, um, I, I was watching it and I was listening to, to Graham talking to, talking to Phil about what was going to play. Graham said, I just like a little bit of melodic embellishment here. That's a lovely phrase, but I just love a little bit of melodic embe em embellishment. And this is what this guy is looking for from Jesus. He comes to Jesus and he says, Jesus, what's my melodic embellishment? What's my, what's my kind of one final thing? What's the, what's the cherry on top of my Sunday? And Jesus responds, my friend, you want melodic embellishment, you are playing the wrong song. You want a cherry on top of your Sunday, you're eating the wrong dessert. This is, you are thinking about this you're thinking about this wrong. You do not need one more step to the perfect life. You do not need this final little stitch to make your life better. You're doing it wrong. Number two on, on exploring the idea of what religion is, it's not something that he does for God. Like he says, what one thing must I do? What additional thing must I do to inherit eternal life? And he thinks it's about doing. He thinks it's about doing. And Jesus says, you've got that wrong. This faith is not something that you do for God. It's something that God does for you. It's something God does for you. So there we go. He's comparing himself to the wrong people. Only God is good. It's not the final step. It's not the cherry on top of the Sunday. It's a completely different way of thinking. And it's not something that you do for God, it's something you receive from God. So bang, 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 Jesus with furious logic has unpacked this, this idea of what it means. And then finally, Jesus explodes his idea of ideas, um, which is the kind of nonsense my, appeals, appeals to my philosophical brain. But this guy wants to keep the discussion at the level of ideas. He wants to keep the discussion at the level of theory. He's probably, he's probably from the school of the Pharisees who love debating the minor points of the law. They love the ideas, the thoughts. Jesus gets personal. Jesus gets personal. In the version of this book in Mark, in Mark, in Mark 10, verse 21, it, it tells us that Jesus looks at him and loves him. One of, the, one of the Old Testament names for, for God is the, the Wonderful Counselor. And we, we see Jesus acting as the Wonderful Counselor here. He knows what this guy needs. He doesn't, he doesn't need to talk about ideas. He's got something going on in here. He's got something personal going on. And Jesus, as he does so often in the, in the Gospels and in, and, and in Luke, sticks, sticks his finger right on it. This is, this is something I used to find a lot at university when talking to people about Christianity. Come up with wonderful theoretical difficulties with, with, uh, with Christianity. Like, I don't know, it seems, it seems exclusive. What about all these other religions? You know, all these theoretical difficulties. And you say, okay, if I can answer that, what's the next thing? What's stopping you? And very often there, you get to some behavior. I know I'd need to change. I know I'd need to stop. I know I'd need to start. These are, these are not theoretical ideas. This is not something you do for God. It's something that God does for you, and it's something that requires a response. So here we go. Jesus refuses to stay on ideas with this man. He challenges him he challenges him personally. Jesus knows his heart. All the way through the book of Luke, we see Jesus challenging people. In fact, this 
interaction is very similar to uh, an interaction he has with, with a guy called Nicodemus who comes to him. And Nicodemus says, you know, what must I do to inherit eternal life or, 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 or for that? And Jesus says, you must be born again, which seems like a similarly impossible, uh, impossible thing to a, to a camel going through the eye of the needle. And he uses this to say, you have a, a, a completely wrong idea about about, about what's going on. For Nicodemus, it was his wisdom and his status, and therefore he needs to be born again and become like a baby with no wisdom and no status. For this guy, it was his money and his finance. His greed is the thing that's keeping him from, from knowing Jesus, not his ideas. His money and his wealth are his security and his power and his confidence. Even the way he's termed that question, even the way he's structured the question, where else uh, sorry, what else can I acquire? What one thing can I get to, to, uh, to make my life complete so I'll inherit eternal life? Um, you know, I've, I've, I've put, this, put this at the bottom. I think, I think we, need to be, you know, we need to be candid. Asking him to give up all of his money is kind of as impossible as asking Nicodemus to be, to be born again. Jesus is not, is not really challenging him on, on 100%. You know, this is the only occasion the only occasion that Jesus says you must give up everything. And I think, I think, you know, if, if, if you have an addict, if you has, have somebody who's fully addicted, you require them to abstain completely. That's, you know, that's, that's how Alcoholics Anonymous works. Alcoholics can't have a little bit of alcohol. They need to abstain completely. And I think this is what Jesus is saying to this young man my friend, you've got a problem. This is an intervention. <laughs> you need to give up 100% of your money. You know, Zacchaeus in the next chapter, we talk about fairness. Zacchaeus, who, you know, who turns up in the next chapter, he is similarly wealthy, and, and, and we, we actually know he's not good. He's, he's cheated people, and he's not asked to give up everything. He gives up half. And then the Old Testament standard, this standard of the tithe, to give up 10% of what you've got. So, the Bible is not saying to everybody, you must give up everything, literally, but it's about attitude and about where our strength comes from and about what we allow to get in the way of our, um, of our, of our relationship with, with Jesus. So let's, let's get into that. His money is his source of life, of power, of joy, and of meaning uh, apart from God. And there's kind of two points here. One, money and wealth might be this for us. It might be that the acquisition of money and of wealth are a thing that are stopping us having a relationship with God. That's possible. There's plenty of people who are like that. But more than that, how we use our money also exposes what our idols are, what our sense of security is, the things we allow to get between ourselves and our relationship with God with God. Um, I really like this phrase, doing, doing research for this, you will find it effortless, effortless to spend money on things that are your real God. I like, I like to give, you know, I like to give to, to people in need. I like to give to uh, the work of God, and I like to give to, uh, to, to, to charities that, that need it. It is an effort. It is an effort, but I like to do it. I find it effortless to spend money on food and wine and kitchen gadgets. <laughs> I find it effortless to spend money on those things. Why? Because I love to have people round. I love to cook food for them. I like to be hospitable. I like to be recognized as a good host. I find it effortless to spend money on nice smart shoes and suits. Why do I find that effortless? Because I like to go to work and be seen as professional and put on a sharp suit and a smart suit and have other people recognize my professionalism and my worth in work and being smart and capable as a professional. How do I know those two things are problems for me? Because spending money on those is effortless, and it's still a bit of an effort to give my money away. How am I doing at that? 
getting better. It changes each day. But how do I, how do I know? You know, I'm, I'm an engineer. And one of the things you would do if you've got a block of metal is you'd put something called dye pen on it. You'd, you'd paint it with this blue dye. And this block of steel that looks solid and structural and like it will bear any weight, suddenly the dye, the dye uh, runs into the cracks and crevices so that when you wipe it off, you see where all the flaws are. And money can be a little bit like that. You will find it effortless to spend money on the things that are your real God. And as you wipe away your life, where is the, where is the dye um, running out of? Like, where are you spending, spending money? Because actually, it's not really about money. This, this Tim Killer quote, you have a power struggle in your life. And that power struggle that you have with God is over your dreams. It's over what you want. It's over where, where, where your treasure is what your power and joy and meaning are. And either your power and joy and meaning can be in God and the person of God in Jesus, or they can be in these other things. Whew. So, yeah, I'll say, a, I'll say a very quick thing. My very quick thing is I recognize I'm a poor messenger for this stuff. I recognize I'm a poor messenger for this, for this stuff. I have lived a life of unending privilege. And there are people in our congregation who have not shared that experience. We have people who, who, who struggles with poverty, with indebtedness, with, with um, difficulties around, around immigration and transferring countries and all, all all the difficulties that can cause you. The Bible is absolutely clear that poverty and indebtedness are crushing. My friends, if you're, if you're struggling with those things, come and see us and come and, come and chat to us. Um, we have links to organizations like Christians Against Poverty. We have uh, links to uh, other organizations where we can help you if money, is a, if money is a real struggle, if indebtedness are, uh, is a real struggle for you, you know, we want to help free you from that. This, this message is not, is not for you. Um, but there are some folks who this message is for. So if you can indulge me for a wee bit longer. So having, having laid that out, Everything is the necessary standard for our giving. Um, how do we respond? I'm a, I, I am, like I said, I'm a, I'm a numbers guy, and I can, see, I can see a couple of people saying, you're a numbers guy, start, put a figure on it. What, what are we doing? What, how are we going wrong? Uh, and I'll, I'll say there are, there are two biblical standards for giving. One of them I mentioned earlier, there's the, there's the Old Testament biblical standard for giving, which is a tithe, a 10%. You know, Don talked about it last week and talked really um, persuasively and biblically about the problems of sticking with 10%. There's, there's that Old Testament standard, and then there's the second biblical standard. There's the New Testament standard, and the New Testament standard for giving is abundance and sacrificially. That's the New Testament standard for giving. We set our sights on Jesus, Jesus who gave to us abundantly and sacrificially. Um, and that's, that's the standard that the New Testament sets for, for our giving. So, so my, first, my, first, my first suggestion is how do, we, how do we respond? We examine ourselves. We do that dipenetrant testing, odd metaphor, but we do that, we do that dipenetrant. We say, where am I holding on to money? Where am I holding on to wealth? Where does it go beyond wealth? Where, where has it become an idol in my life? I think, I think point two is to recognize that, that giving can change our attitude. We expect our attitude towards something to change before we give to it. Actually, that's not true. Giving, giving can change your attitude. Beginning to give um, changes your attitude. And then this third point, that the standard that's set for us is 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 radical uh, 
uh, generosity. I think I think that's t- taking taking from the Acts twenty that that the quote I pulled there was was when Paul uses it in Acts 20. It's more blessed to to give than to receive. Paul quotes Jesus at the end of his ministry, like I was saying, to say to his followers, follow the gospel and give. And that's that's what he says. And this word blessed, we've kind of devalued in our society. We've We've kind of boil washed it off to colory nothingness. The word is deep and rich. It's drawn from the Beatitudes, Jesus says it's more blessed to give than to receive. And what he means is the blessing of God is is a restoration, a repairing of the relationship we had with God in the Garden of Eden. It's, it's, It's color returning back to our lives. It's us knowing our place and our place being being under God. You can heal the world and heal relationships through through that giving, through that radical giving. But we are not going to do that if we have the wrong wrong heart on our giving. Giving is a a matter of heart. My dad dad, uh, worked for a a charity in his whole career, and he's a member of the Chartered Institute of Professional Fundraisers and Developers. So that's, that's that's a professional qualification if ever I heard it. Um, and he will talk about the value proposition you put on a charity. How do you, how do you build this value proposition? What is, what is your value proposition? And they'll talk about how you build a, a mind-based value proposition where you use logic. They'll talk about how you build an emotional value proposition where you hook people into to emotions. They'll talk about the return value proposition where, where you value. And godly generosity is, is none of these things. You will find Christian ministries that play on your sense of bargaining, they, they really shouldn't. They make a, a direct link between you giving and God giving back, or you not giving and God withholding from you. That's wrong. There's nothing biblical there. But let's, be, let's be super clear about that. Two, it does not play on your emotions. It does not tie you into feeling that, that you should. This is not about tying you into your emotions. And it's not about your mind. It's not about give so that we can build. It's about none of these things. It's simply a response to the grace that we've been given. All these other things that you might invest your life in, all these other things that you might invest your life in will demand more from you. It's a bit, it's a bit clanky, but there is a man in Moscow who in order to hang on to his power, in order to hang on to his wealth, is currently invading and destroying a- another country. It's a bit of a clanky version and an extreme sense, but you, but you see where I'm going with this, that if, you, if your source of life and joy comes from your own power and your own money, you will do monstrous things to hold on to it you will consistently do monstrous things to hold on to it because our hearts are, hearts are all the same. There is a second rich young ruler in this story. I don't, know if you've, I don't know if you've noticed. I don't know if you see where I'm going with this. Jesus talks to a rich young ruler. He is at, at the same time about 31, 32. He has just left a heaven of enormous riches to come to earth where he was in control and he was in command and he has left heaven, removed himself of all of his glory and come to earth to save us. He is not calling that rich young ruler to anything that he himself has not done already. He is not saying, I need you to lose everything but, but I'm okay. Jesus is only calling us to follow his own example in response to the grace that we have been given. This, this lyric, love will not betray you, dismay or enslave you, it will set you free, is a Mumford and Sons lyric. This is, this is Jesus' love. All these other idols you set up for your money will betray you, dismay you, or enslave you. You have been given grace already. 
free it to be the person that, use it to free you to be the person that you, that you, that you were made to be. We are called to radical generosity by a savior of radical generosity. There's, there's one day, and it's coming for all of us, that we will share the experience of that rich young ruler. We will stand in front of Jesus and give an account of ourselves, of, of, of what we've done. And when we stand there, I, I won't have, well, I was a really generous host. I was a really generous host. And I, I had people into my home and made them feel great. I will not have, I was a really committed professional. People, people really valued my professional input. I won't even have, I was a really good wife to Ruth and a really good dad to, to George and Hugo, whose names I generally remember. I was a really good dad to George and Hugo. That, those, those are not the status that I will stand on when I stand in front of Jesus. There's one thing, we, we, we sang about it earlier, there's Jesus' blood and his righteousness. He has, he has given everything for you, and he, he explodes our standards of what it means to be good, of, 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 of what we expect to get from our giving, and he wants to get personal with you in, in achieving that. So, as we continue off into, into freely, freely we've received, freely, freely we give, I hope, I hope that's been helpful. Um, I'd really love to have a conversation with you if, it's, if, it's, you know, if any of it's butted up against a, uh, something you're feeling or something you're thinking. Um, I'd, love, I'd love to talk it through with you. If any of it's touched a nerve in a good way, um, the prayer team um, will be available to, to have a pray. And I think if you want to go and use that space or you want to sit where you are, the um, prayer team will come and, 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 and pray with you and talk you through. Um, if, if we can care for you in any way uh, around finance and around, uh, around um, problems of indebtedness, um, our, our care and pastoral team will be about and we can, we can hook you up with somebody, with somebody there as well. But this is... This is, where, this is where Jesus is calling us right now. This is, this is what he's saying to us. He's saying, I have, I have given everything for you. Come now and follow me. Lord God, I want to thank you for, for your word. I want to thank you for the privilege that digging down into it uh, this week has been. I want to thank you for the, for the things you've shown me about my own heart and the things you've shown me about, about who I am and where my, um, where my idols and sense of belonging lie. Lord God, I want to grow to be more like you. Uh, I want to grow to uh, be, be filled by a, a desire for for your things. Lord God, I pray for us as a church. Um, I pray for us as we, as we continue to, to meditate around um, what we've received from you and how we, how we give to the world. Um, Lord God, I pray that you, that you touch us all, that you, that you speak to us, that you continue to, to counsel us um, as, as Jesus counseled this rich young man and, 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 and show us where we have um, uh, flaws and, and weak spots in our own hearts and our own attitudes uh, and our own approach to giving. Lord God, I, I thank you for the example of, of your son Jesus um, who died to give us life and life to the fullness and rose to give us hope. Amen.